Yellow birches are trees that don't mind having their feet wet. They are usually found in wet habitats along streams and near the edges of wetlands. Yet the one pictured here is growing high on the rim of Little Mountain at over 1,200 feet elevation, not far from the highest elevation in Lake County. The reason it thrives up here is the large amount of groundwater absorbed, held, and then gradually released by the conglomerate that formed this cliff. Sandstones and conglomerates are porous, which means they can absorb and hold water in minute pores between the grains of the rock, and permeable, which means they can allow water to slowly move through the rock. This photo shows the base of the Sharon Formation near the contact with the underlying Meadville Shale member of the Cuyahoga Formation. Unlike the permeable rock that overlies it, the Meadville Shale is impermeable to water. As rainwater slowly seeps downward through the Sharon conglomerate, it eventually reaches the contact with the underlying shale. Unable to penetrate the shale, the water seeps out at the base of the outcrop forming numerous and muddy seeps and springs at the base of the conglomerate outcrop. An analogy might be a saturated sponge on a glass top coffee table leaking water at its base. The hilltop ledge formed by the Sharon conglomerate accumulates water at its base in a series of seeps, springs, and pools. Accumulating water soon starts to run downslope over the weathered shale and glacial till. The dark zone seen in the lower left-hand corner of this photo is one of several runs that will begin to combine into larger runs, creeks, and rivers, eventually ending up in Lake Erie. But it won't stop there. The muddy, saturated run we see here is the beginning of a watershed that reaches all the way to to the Atlantic Ocean by way of the St. Lawrence Seaway through Quebec. Here is an example of massive Sharon conglomerate exposed on a weathered cliff face at Little Mountain. Conglomerate is a clastic sedimentary rock. Clastic rocks consist of eroded sand and pebbles derived from much older rocks, the source of the quartz pebbles and sandy matrix shown here. Quartz is an exceptionally hard mineral made of silicon dioxide or silica. Its durability allows it to withstand chemical weathering, physical erosion, and long-distance transport. Pebbles, cobbles, and boulders of the Sharon Formation can be found everywhere, in glacial till, on stream beds, and on Lake Erie beaches, sometimes miles from the nearest conglomerate outcrop. Alongside pieces of real conglomerate, you can also find eroded, rounded objects that resemble conglomerate but are man-made. By definition, a rock has to be naturally occurring, so how can you identify something that isn't natural? There are three clues. The clasts or pebbles in the Sharon conglomerate first come in a variety of sizes ranging from pea size to over two inches in diameter. Second, they are rounded and smoothed by erosion. And third, they consist entirely of pure white quartz. In contrast, the clasts, or engineers would call it aggregate, in the two samples pictured here, First, are roughly all the same size, indicating they were sorted by machine. Second, they're highly angular in shape, evidence of having passed through a rock crusher. And third, consists of a variety of materials other than quartz, such as limestone, like the one on the right. If we could break apart the dark and stained cliffs of Sharon Conglomerate or Little Mountain, we would expose fresh, unweathered surfaces of a rather attractive cream-colored rock. This photo shows a two-foot-wide section of a small boulder of freshly cut Sharon conglomerate lying on the floor of the best sand quarry south, south of Chardon, Ohio. We are looking down on a lithified, hardened into rock, bedding plain of a 315 million year old gravel bar as though we were standing on it. It will look familiar to anyone who has ever waded across a gravel bar along a modern creek, river, or beach. Here is a photo of the soil surface at the base of the cliff at Little Mountain. It consists of recently eroded sand and pebbles from the Sharon conglomerate outcrop lying on top of glacial till deposited some 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Early settlers called the quartz pebbles lucky stones, although no one knows how they got the reputation for garnering good luck. This is an example of the rock cycle, one of the most important concepts in geology. Ancient metamorphic and sedimentary rocks yielded the quartz, sand, and pebbles that eventually compacted into the 315 million year old Sharon Formation. 
The Sharon rocks are now disintegrating into sand and pebbles that are slowly being transported to Lake Erie and perhaps all the way to the Atlantic. There they will reach dispositional environments where they may someday again compact into sandstone or conglomerate, continuing the countless cycles of rock formation, erosion, and recompaction. This photo shows a classic sedimentary structure at the entrance to Devil's Kitchen. It's a fine example of a scour feature called a horse belly by old-time geologists. Structures like these are telltale signs of fluvial sedimentation, a technical term for terrestrial sediments deposited by a river. Here, a U-shaped scour channel was eroded into sandy bottom of the Sharon River during a violent storm. Later, the scour was filled in with gravel as the storm subsided. Calmer waters deposited more sandstone above the scour structure, resulting in the three layers we see today, sandstone below, conglomerate filling the scour structure in the middle, and more sandstone on top. The Sharon conglomerate has many exposures of a sedimentary structure known as trough cross stratification pictured above where we see a curved or scoop shaped surface at the bottom of a gravel filled trough. It formed when a storm scoured a depression in the sandy river bottom that later filled with gravel when the storm flow began to subside. During a subsequent storm, the gravel deposit was partially truncated by another trough seen at the upper right of the photo. Rivers are constantly depositing, eroding, and redepositing their own sediments as they twist and turn across the landscape. Gravel-filled troughs like this one are characteristic of braided streams. Braided streams occur in high latitudes at the toe of glaciers or anywhere where massive amounts of sediments are quickly eroding from high mountains. Braided stream beds are shallow and choked with sediment, forming many sand and gravel bars within interwoven channels. Whenever you visit an outcrop, take a close look at the rock. You might see textures and patterns that most people overlook. All of them provide important clues about how and where the rock was deposited. Pictured here is a three-foot tall view of a vertical cliff of Sharon Conglomerate at Little Mountain. In the bottom quarter of the photo, we see many quartz pebbles in a sandstone matrix arranged in horizontal beds. Above this layer, it starts to get interesting. We see alternating beds of conglomerate and sandstone slanting or dipping about 20 degrees to the left, called cross beds by geologists. They form wherever a fluid, such as air or water, flows rapidly over unconsolidated mobile material such as sand or gravel. The orientation of the dipping beds reveals the direction of the ancient river current, in this case from right to left or north to south. Thousands of such features have been measured and mapped for the ancient Sharon River and they all indicate a river that flowed to the south. About three feet to the left of a six foot tall stick used for scale, we see on this cliff face some oddly contorted folded layers of Sharon conglomerate. This is an example of penicontemporaneous deformation, a tongue-twisting term used to describe sedimentary layers that have slipped, slid, shifted, or contorted before they hardened into rock. Of several geologists who have examined this outcrop or seen photos of it, none has been able to offer an explanation for how this happened. Possible explanations include shearing caused by a flash flood or a violent earthquake, but no one knows for sure. The only certainty is that this structure is unique to Little Mountain. Nothing on this scale has been found elsewhere in the Sharon conglomerate of Ohio or Pennsylvania. This photo shows the root plate of an overturned one foot diameter tree on the summit of Little Mountain. The soil clinging to this root mass looks nothing like the soil we would see clinging to the roots of trees toppled elsewhere in northeast Ohio. Classified as a spotosol, it normally occurs in large tracts bordering the tundra across North America and Eurasia. Note the relative absence of a duff layer, or rotting leaf litter layer, and lack of clay. There is a marked difference between soils on the flanks and on the summit of Little Mountain. The soil probe shown here was taken on a gentle slope in a deciduous forest near the trail leading to the first outcrop. As we look from the top to bottom of the six inch core, we first see two or three inches of a rich brown layer of leaf litter in various stages of decomposition known as the duff layer. 
Beneath the duff layer we see two to four inches of mottled, silty loam, the most fertile part of the soil profile. Beneath that is a dense yellow clay that extends all the way to bedrock. This profile is typical of undisturbed glacial soils in northeast Ohio. This close-up shows a 12-inch section of the sandy, gravelly spodicil, obviously derived from erosion of the Sharon conglomerate that underlies it, covering the summit of Little Mountain. Spodicils form in sandy material that receive large amounts of rainfall and snowmelt. They are highly acidic, with a pH as low as 3.3 on Little Mountain. They are rich in iron and aluminum, which is bad for root respiration. They are low in calcium, potassium, and magnesium, which are minerals needed for plant growth. They are poor in soil fauna, which is needed for soil aeration, structure, decomposition, and nutrient cycling. And they are fast draining, which makes them vulnerable to drought. To find the next nearest deposit of spodicil, you would have to drive all the way to northern Michigan, an area, like the summit of Little Mountain, not known for agriculture. 